Hello again and welcome to Chamber Abnormalities. In this video we'll talk about how to diagnose signs of chamber enlargement just by looking at your patient's EKG. And so we'll talk about how to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement, and we'll talk about the significance of finding low voltage on an EKG. And so let's go ahead and get started. Now you'll remember that this is the algorithm that I use each time I read an EKG. You can see how far we've gone so far with these videos. We've talked about rate, rhythm and intervals, axis and transition, and now we're going to talk about hypertrophy. Now I'll say that for the step of hypertrophy, we look at a little bit more than just hypertrophy. And so each time I read an EKG, I ask myself the following questions. I ask myself, are there signs of left ventricular hypertrophy? How about right ventricular hypertrophy? Are there signs of left atrial enlargement? How about right atrial enlargement? And finally, I ask myself, are there signs of low voltage? Now, unfortunately, these criteria are just something that you have to memorize in order to be able to diagnose these findings on an EKG, but I'll try to explain the rationale to you in a way that's a little bit easier to conceptualize. And so let's take a look at this cross-section through the chest. This diagram represents a simplified cross-section through the chest. Now you might remember this from the last video, however I'll say that since the last time we met, I've managed to draw these ventricles a little bit better to scale. That said, it still represents a bit of a simplification in that you can see that I've put the six precordial leads and the four chambers all nicely lined up at the same level. But it should hopefully give you a general idea of the orientation of the chambers in the heart with respect to the precordial leads and help you understand the basis for the diagnostic criteria we use to diagnose chamber enlargement. So let's start with LVH. So if you had left ventricular hypertrophy, you'd notice that the force of the depolarization would be greater out here in the area of the left ventricle. As a consequence, you'd notice that your QRS complex is more positive out here in leads V5 and V6, which are closer to the left ventricle. Similarly, in lead V1, you would see a QRS complex that looks mostly like an opposite, and so it would be more negative. In other words, if you had LVH, you'd notice that in leads V5 and V6, the R waves, which represent the positive deflection, are taller. And similarly, in lead V1, you'd notice that the S waves, which represent the negative deflection, are deeper. Thus, if you wanted to diagnose LVH, you could look to see if the depth of the S wave in lead V1 plus the height of the R wave in lead V5 or V6 exceeds 35 millimeters. This represents the most commonly used criterion for LVH, and it's known as the Sokolo line criterion, named after the guys who identified it. Unfortunately, there's no call rate criteria yet. Now, I should say that the diagnostic criteria for chamber enlargement are fairly low in sensitivity, and as such, most patients who have, let's say, a touch of LVH due to high blood pressure won't meet diagnostic criteria for LVH based on the EKG. That said, when you are able to diagnose chamber enlargement from looking at an EKG, it points to much more clinically meaningful disease. Common causes of left ventricular hypertrophy include systemic hypertension and valvular heart disease such as aortic stenosis. Now with LVH, there are a number of diagnostic criteria out there. However, I find that it's helpful to memorize at least two. And so in addition to a precordial lead criteria, I'm going to tell you a limb lead criteria that's pretty easy to remember. To diagnose LVH, you can look in lead AVL and see if the height of the R wave is taller than 11 millimeters. An easy way to conceptualize this is to just remember that lead AVL gives us the best view of the left side of the heart in the frontal plane. And so if you had LVH, you'd notice that the forces are more positive in lead AVL. Now I should mention that when you have left axis deviation, your QRS complexes will already look more positive out on the left side, and as a consequence, the threshold to call something LVH becomes a little bit higher. And so in this case, you'll need an R wave that's taller than 13 millimeters in lead AVL to call something LVH. Now I should also mention that while the specificity of diagnostic criteria for chamber abnormalities are generally pretty good, there are reasons to have false positive findings. So for example, many patients who are young and thin have more prominent forces over the precordial leads. And so as a consequence, many of them will meet diagnostic criteria for LVH, but not actually have it. Now you'll notice that some patients with LVH can have more prominent Q deflections at the beginning of the QRS complex. Now remember that physiologically, the Q wave represents depolarization of the intraventricular septum. And so over here we have a septal Q wave. And so sometimes with long-standing hypertrophy, you can find more noticeable septal Q waves. 
Notice that this Q is lowercase, that denotes that it's a small Q deflection, as opposed to an uppercase Q which represents a pathologic Q wave, which can indicate myocardial necrosis due to MI. To better conceptualize why some patients with ventricular hypertrophy can have more noticeable septal Q waves, understand that when you have hypertrophy of a chamber, the whole chamber gets thicker. And so, for example, with LVH, the septal side of the left ventricle also becomes thicker, and as a consequence, the forces of septal depolarization become more noticeable. And so patients with long-standing hypertrophy can sometimes develop more prominent septal Q waves in leads that have more prominent R waves. And so with LVH, you can sometimes see septal Q waves in leads V5, V6, or AVL. Similarly with RVH, you can also sometimes see septal Q waves in leads that have more noticeable R deflections. And so in this case, leads V1 and 3. Now sometimes when you look at the EKGs of patients who have long-standing hypertrophy, you can sometimes notice characteristic changes in the ST segment and T wave, where the ST segment becomes more depressed and the T wave becomes more inverted. This is what we refer to as a secondary repolarization abnormality. Now it's important to know that this is only sometimes seen in severe long-standing hypertrophy. A more important cause of ST depressions and T wave inversions is cardiac ischemia. And so if you see ST depressions and T wave inversions on an EKG, the first question that should pop into your head is, is this something serious like an MI? Now let's talk about RVH. With right ventricular hypertrophy, you'll notice that the forces of ventricular depolarization become more prominent in the vicinity of the right ventricle. And so as a consequence, you'll notice that in lead V1, the QRS complex will look more positive. Thus, one easy diagnostic criterion for RVH is to simply look in lead V1 and look to see if the height of the R wave is taller than the depth of the S wave. In other words, look to see if the QRS complex looks positive. Now I should also say that in addition to having this, you should have a QRS axis that's either vertical or rightward. And even more suggestive of RVH is if you see T wave inversions in the right precordial leads. So for example, V1 and V2. Again, I should point out that the sensitivity of these criteria aren't great. However, if you do have a patient who meets these criteria, it's much more likely to signify clinically meaningful disease. Important causes of right ventricular hypertrophy include congenital heart disease, mitral stenosis, and pulmonary hypertension, for example, due to severe lung disease. Now let's talk about atrial enlargement. With atrial enlargement, we sometimes use the term atrial abnormality instead of enlargement when looking at the EKG. It's easiest to think of this as a technical way of acknowledging that patients can sometimes meet criteria for enlargement but not actually have enlarged atria. So let's look at the left atrium. Remember that it's located more posteriorly in the heart. So with left atrial enlargement, the forces of atrial depolarization will become oriented more posteriorly. Thus, if you were to put a precordial lead on a patient's back, you might notice that the P wave looks more positive. Now we don't put leads on the back, but looking at these six precordial leads, which one do you think would help you the most at identifying left atrial enlargement? So you'll notice that lead V1 is situated on the opposite side, directly anterior to the heart. Thus, in a patient with left atrial enlargement, you'll often notice that the P wave in lead V1 becomes more negative, kind of like this one. Now, in some patients with left atrial enlargement, you'll notice that the P wave looks biphasic, more like this one. This is because the initial part of the P wave represents depolarization of the right atrium, which tends to depolarize more anteriorly, while the terminal part of the P wave reflects depolarization of the enlarged left atrium, which takes longer to finish depolarizing. Thus, to diagnose left atrial enlargement, we can look at lead V1 for a P wave that is negative or biphasic. Note that many patients can have negative appearing P waves in lead V1, and so to call something left atrial enlargement or left atrial abnormality, you typically need the area under the curve of the negative deflection to be greater than one small box. In other words, the negative component of the P wave is more negative than 0.04 seconds by one millimeter. Now, an alternate way to diagnose left atrial abnormality is to look in lead two for a P wave that's broad, broader than 0.12 seconds or three small boxes. Also in lead two, the P wave can sometimes look notched. This again reflects the enlarged left atrium taking a bit longer to finish depolarizing and producing a second hump on the P wave. Important causes of left atrial abnormality include hypertensive heart disease, cardiomyopathies of any cause, 
coronary artery disease, and valvular heart disease, especially aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation, as well as mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Okay, now let's talk about right atrial abnormality. So when the right atrium enlarges, its forces tend to become oriented more inferiorly in the frontal plane. Thus, a commonly used criterion to diagnose right atrial abnormality is to look inferiorly in lead 2 for P wave that's taller than 2.5 millimeters. Now, in right atrial abnormality, the amplitude of the P wave increases, but the duration stays the same, so its appearance looks characteristically peaked and narrow. This is in contrast to a left atrial abnormality, which is characterized by P waves that are broad. Now this next one I'm going to put in parentheses because it's optional to memorize. An alternate criterion for diagnosing right atrial abnormality is to look in lead V1 for a P wave that's taller than 1.5 millimeters. Now I should point out, however, that the sensitivity and specificity of either criteria for right atrial abnormality is not very good. Important causes of right atrial abnormality include congenital heart disease such as pulmonic stenosis and pulmonary disease acute or chronic, for example severe COPD, or acute pulmonary embolism. Now you might come across EKGs of patients who meet criteria for both right and left atrial abnormality. We call this biatrial abnormality or biatrial enlargement. This diagnosis is easier to make than a diagnosis of biventricular hypertrophy, which is trickier and more nuanced. 